Well, hello there. Welcome to our live webinar. We're talking about how you can keep your children safe online. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, if you're here live, uh, watch out for you in the chat box. Uh, if not, if you're watching this on replay, then welcome. I'm sure we get a lot out of this. Um, I'm going to get right into it because there's a lot of stuff that I want to talk about today. Um, and I don't want to I want to make sure that we stick to the time. Um, so just introducing myself briefly to you. Uh, I've got Peaceful Digital Parenting here because that is actually my brand. Uh, if you Google Peaceful Digital Parenting, then um, I pretty much am page one of the results, um, Google or YouTube. So that's what I'm all about, which is, you know, digital parenting, parenting in the digital age and keeping it peaceful so that we have good relationships with our kids or as, as peaceful peaceful home as possible. Um, children and technology is, that's just the business. And my name is Ruth. So I want to start out today with just a warning. Um, and so I'm just going to read this out to you. So some of the content in this presentation may be confronting. My job is not to shield you from the truth, but to help you keep your children safe and happy. That's what it's all about. My aim is to empower you to handle the dangers your children face around technology and to help you raise children who are resilient. Resilient is key, so, so important. This can only happen by increasing your level of awareness. So every statistic I share has come from a reliable source. Every story I share is true. I'm certainly not making things up. Um, but I just want to uh, set the scene, I guess, to say some of this may be confronting. Um, but hiding you from that doesn't really help you. It doesn't help your kids. So uh, hopefully that's okay. We can move on. Today's promise is that I'm going to show you a way to guide your children safely through technology with confidence and alleviate your fears about what they're getting up to online. So I use the word alleviate as opposed to eliminate because I don't want to set up an unrealistic expectation. It's not possible to make sure that nothing bad will ever happen to your child, that they're never going to be involved or caught up in cyber bullying, that they're never going to be approached by a stranger online. You know, that's never going to see porn. That's quite unlikely, so I'm certainly not going to promise that. But what this is about is minimising the chances of things going wrong when they're online. And if something does go wrong, it's about minimising the damage that is caused by it. So it's really like a risk management thing is what we're trying to uh, achieve here. So if you uh, stay on, presumably you stay on till the end and watch this, uh, stick with me for the webinar, <clears throat> it is definitely worthwhile for you. Um, I'm going to gift you a whole lot of really useful information that you'll get so much out of. Just one part of this might be enough to make a huge difference um, in your family. So stick around. I'll explain what all of this means uh, as we go through a bit later on. Um, but definitely worth hanging around to um, access that for nothing. Okay, so today we're going to talk about a little bit about my story, my background, and why I'm, I'm so passionate about doing what I'm doing. This really isn't about me, but I do need to put things in perspective. Um, we're going to talk about, um, oh, sorry, I need to change that. It's actually five key problems um, that we're facing as parents. I think there are actually way more than five. And I used to talk about seven. There's nine I could easily talk about. Um, but I can't talk about everything today because time is against us. So we're just going to pick out five of the key problems that uh, we're facing and what you can do about them. Three common mistakes that a lot of parents make so that you don't make the same ones. And I'm going to go through some solutions for more help. Um, if that's okay. I see a lot of people uh, do similar to me. You go and talk to people, um, talk to parents about how to keep your children safe uh, and they kind of let you know what's going on but then they don't actually help you or offer you a solution to help. Um, so that's not overly helpful. What I want to do is, is let you know what's going on, raise that level of awareness um, and then there are, let's just let you know there are, there is help out there if you want it. If you don't want it, that's perfectly fine as well. Okay, so the main aim of this is, is just to increase your level of awareness and, um, and it is about taking action. You really do need to take some action if you want your kids to be safe online. It's not, it's not as easy as we might hope, which is why we have the problems that we have. So um, some stats to start out. Around 90% of children aged 8 to 16 have viewed porn online while doing their homework. Now, why so many? Not because suddenly kids are just filthy-minded and have, I don't know, are doing something naughty. It's not that at all. It's that it's everywhere. So one in 12 websites, I think it is, is a pornographic website. It's, it's just all over the place and it's so easy to find. It's very, very easy to find by mistake. So usually what happens is that a child will be doing their homework, they'll click on something that they don't know what it is or it seems like it's innocent 
but when you go to um, the result of wherever you've clicked, then it's not so innocent at all. Um, and often, you know, ads, there's an awful lot of ads that lead to um, content like that. So it's not that they're trying to do the wrong thing, it's just that it's so available, um, they're stumbling across it by mistake. Usually the first time they see it, they sort of get grossed out, and, that's disgusting. Um, but then a part of them gets a little bit excited about it and then they sort of get a bit curious and what was that actually? And, and that's when they can start to seek it out and that's when they can start to watch more and more of it and start really having a problem. Uh, so 60% of children, three out of five children, um, have created accounts for social media or apps that their parents don't know about. So what often happens, and, and with every survey, without fail, what we think our kids are doing and what our kids are doing um, are not the same thing. So we all think that, you know, it's not our kids that are, that are on social media without us knowing because we would know if they are. Well, everybody thinks that they would know if they are. Um, but in fact, a lot of us don't know. Kids are very smart. If they want to do something without you knowing about it, then they probably will. Again, not because they're being naughty, but just because of peer pressure. If their friends are doing something, it's in our nature, it's in the nature of every human being that we don't want to miss out. We don't want to be the one that isn't doing what our friends are doing, of course. Um, so it's a high chance that our kids are there. So now you've got, so I guess there's a 9 in 10 chance that you, you, your child will see porn online while they're doing a home rec. There's a 3 in 5 chance, um, pretty good chance that your kids may be on social media even if you don't know it. It could be also that maybe you know that they're on Instagram, but you don't know they're on Snapchat or you know they're on Facebook and you don't know where else they might be. 16% um, of students who are bullied seriously consider suicide as a result of that. Cyberbullying really can get bad and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later because it is the number one fear for most of us um, that our kids will get caught up in cyberbullying in some way. So 8% of, um, of that 16% who are bullied that seriously considering suicide actually do attempt and, and about one in 10 um, do commit suicide. This is just like horrendous and this is one of the huge reasons why I do what I do because uh, you know in my mind one one student committing suicide, one child committing suicide is, is one too many um, and it's something that we really really need to stop. So um, just a little bit about me, I am um, a normal mum I guess. I have two kids myself. They just had birthdays recently. They're now seven and ten years old. Um, I'm busy as most parents are. I don't know if many parents sit around twiddling their thumbs all day wondering what to do with themselves. Um, so I work. I do a lot of research. I try to keep fit, do some exercise. Um, when all this started for me, I was actually training in karate as well three times a week, working towards my black belt. Um, taking the, ferrying the kids around everywhere, doing stuff that the parents do, right? So I'm, I'm just a normal, busy parent, I guess. I have really open and honest relationships with my boys and I take a lot of pride in that and I really, really value that because um, that's really key. It's really key to everything. Okay? Communication, you know, honest relationships is everything with your family. My boys are, um, I'm very blessed. They're happy, they're healthy. Um, they're well balanced. What I mean by that is that they spend some time online they do play games online and i've never stopped them doing that um, and i don't believe in that i don't think it's practical or really viable or in their best interests anyway uh, so i do allow my kids to spend some time online but they're at the point where they use it um, safely they get the benefits of being there without the pitfalls and that's what this is all about it's not about hiding it from them um, it's about the kids knowing when to be online and what to do when they're online and making sure that they're okay when they're there and they're getting some benefit out of it. So that's where I'm at now. It's not where I was at before um, when this started for me. So let me just explain and put this all in perspective. Um, that's not, incidentally, my uh, picture of my son. I didn't want to put my son there for his protection. Um, so if that's your son, I apologise. Just got, grab that from online. Um, but anyway, my son, when he was six years old, he was in year one uh, at a new school. Um, and his best friend was into Pokemon and introduced him to Pokemon. Now, I don't think at that point my son even knew what Pokemon was, but very quickly he certainly did know what it was, and he became completely obsessed. So I don't know if your kids are into Pokemon. This is before Pokemon Go. This is just the old-fashioned Pokemon. It's been around for 20 years or so. Um, and what happened was Pokemon is 
a very complex game. There's a million characters in it and the characters evolve into, into other characters and there's, they have different um, techniques they use to fight in battles and they have different regions and they have different masters and they have, it's really a very complex game. And I think that the reason that my son became so obsessed with it is because it is so complex uh, and he's quite bright and it challenged his brain um, and it was stimulating for him. And it's a game where, like most games, you can just go on and on and on and on, really, and not stop. So interestingly, at this point in time, um, my son had actually asked if he could play a Minecraft, because other kids, of course, were playing a Minecraft as well. Um, and I said no to Minecraft because I understood um, how obsessive that can get. Um, in hindsight, I kind of wish I'd said yes to Minecraft, because if I had the choice between Minecraft and Pokemon, I think I would go for Minecraft. But anyway, um, it happened to be Pokemon in this instance. When I say my son became obsessed, I mean that he wanted to, it, it was all he thought about was Pokemon. So whether he was actually playing it or just thinking about it, running through battles and scenarios in his head, he could have been playing it on his 3DS, uh, watching shows on TV uh, or on our computer, um, playing on an iPad. Didn't really matter what he was doing, but his mind was just completely obsessed with Pokemon. So meanwhile, this happened, and this all happened really fast in a very short space of time. Um, so I was busy, like I said, doing my, doing my mum thing, as you do, and didn't really realise what had happened, but it all happened really fast. And as a result of this Pokemon thing going on in his head, um, my son was ignoring me uh, and pretty much ignoring anyone. So um, I presume you're not, we're probably quite similar in that as a parent, we don't particularly enjoy being ignored by our kids. So uh, because I would have to say things again and again and again to him and it was, I, I honestly don't know even now whether he was ignoring it or whether he just didn't hear me. Um, but either way, I was saying something and it wasn't going anywhere. So I was getting really annoyed and having to say things again and again and I would end up just yelling and screaming at him um, a lot. And I sort of, I only bothered to talk to him. It got to the point where, well, it, it's so hard to get through to him but the only time I bothered was pretty much to tell him what to do. So my, you know, all that was coming out of my mouth was, you know, we'd be getting ready for school and I'd go, you know, have you brushed your teeth? You know, have you brushed your teeth? I told you to brush your teeth. Come on, we need to go. Why aren't you dressed yet? Have you got your stuff in your bag? Hurry up. You, you know, it was like just dictating, I guess. And it wasn't, we sort of lost um, the quality conversations that we used to have because it was just too hard to have them. It's too, too much. It's just too difficult to get through. So I, I felt like I was this angry sort of dictator all the time, which is not the way you want to be communicating with your kids. Sometimes you have to, but um, it's not shouldn't be the predominant method of communication. My son was out of control when it was time to get him off the games. And hopefully you haven't experienced this. If you have, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but when it was time to get him off, he did not want to stop playing. And, and I wasn't letting him, you know, it's not like he had the iPad on him or glued to him all the time. I wasn't letting him play not forever but um, when it was time to get him off there he would just get really angry and he'd yell at me and he'd like form a fist and like he would be pretty mad like it was it was pretty bad um, just out of control when it was time to, to stop playing it's really not a pleasant experience at all to say the least um, he was ignoring interestingly it wasn't just me that he was ignoring he was ignoring his friends as well and also um, like extended family, the grandparents, aunts, uncles, and kind of was really rude when we were out with them. But he'd even he'd walk to school and his friends would say hello to him and he would ignore them because, again, he was just in his mind not there. He was just going through this, you know, imagining different Pokemon stuff going on um, and ignoring everyone. So his social circle at school was quite small and it was limited only to other kids who were also pretty much obsessed with Pokemon, which is, is not a good thing. You want your kids to have a nice wide social circle. So I effectively went from feeling like I'm a pretty capable mum, generally, I think I'm doing okay as a, as a mum, um, to going, oh my goodness, what is going on? Um, I don't know what to do. I have no idea what's just happened or how it's happened. And I felt really just overwhelmed by this whole um, thing that was going on, this whole obsession, and I felt really inadequate felt like I, I just, for the first time, I really had no clue what to do. 
Um, and it came to a head one day when we were walking to school and it's amazing how you can be next to someone um, physically and be miles away from them. And this is what happened this one day. I just, I wanted to talk to my son. We're on the way to school. Um, we're lucky that we can walk to school or we could where we were then, uh, where we lived. Anyway, so I'm walking along and it's a nice, quiet, peaceful street. And I asked my son something and he ignored me and he's going down the road going, Shh, you know, Pikachu, I choose you. Shh, and pretending he's doing this battle. And um, anyway, I asked him a few questions and was really trying to break through because I just wanted to talk to him. I just really, really wanted to talk to him. And um, repeatedly that didn't work and he just ignored me. So then I just cracked it. I just completely lost control. Um, in the middle of this otherwise peaceful street one day and I just I just lost it. I just was like yelling and screaming at the top of my voice, um, kind of disturbing the peace, I guess, but I didn't really care. I don't know who was around, but I'm sure I would have embarrassed my son at this point in time, um, but I was so upset, you know, when you get to that point where you just, that's it, just had enough, <laughs> just completely cracked it. Um, and so after I was yelling and screaming at him, I then just burst into tears. And I realised that I was, I was angry. I was um, just at a loss. And I was really scared because I didn't know how to get my son back. And it was pretty obvious that I'd lost, but, you know, lines of communication with him were just not there anymore. Um, and he was only six years old. And it's like I'd lost him. I didn't even know who he was anymore. So I was really, really upset, um, which might have been a good thing because sometimes I think, unfortunately, we have to hit rock bottom. The situation has to get really bad for us to be motivated to actually do something about it. And that was my motivation that day. I went, you know, by the time I got home, I thought, well, that's it. I'm not, we're not doing this anymore. Um, something has to change. So it did change. I call that my, my awakening. I woke up um, and I realised that, you know, complaining about what was happening um, to whoever might listen was just really boring for other people, but also just totally um, ineffective and wasting time. And so, you know, Justin Herald says, it, says if nothing changes, nothing changes. If I didn't change something that I was doing, my son wasn't going to change what he was doing and nothing was going to change. So um, had to do something. Um, time is short. You know, kids grow up so fast, don't they? Um, and I didn't, I just wasn't willing to lose any more time. With him. So... I had what we call a paradigm shift where I looked at the situation from a whole new perspective. What I had been doing was being really angry a lot. I was angry with my son because I was annoyed with him and he was driving me nuts, not, not listening to me. Um, I was really angry with his best friend who introduced him to the game because if he hadn't done that, then maybe this whole thing wouldn't have happened. I was angry with the, with the creators of Pokemon because they obviously it's obvious that they intend to create a game that is going to be addictive and that works. Um, and being angry with everyone really wasn't very helpful. So what I realised was there was this, it was like a big wall, a big barrier that had been created between there was me on this side and there was my son on that side and we just weren't, we just weren't on the same side. So I realised that rather than fighting with him all the time, I'm supposed to be on his side. My son and I were supposed to be on his side. He needed help because he had a problem at this point. So I needed to, there's the wall there, I can't remember which side I said who was on, but let's say my son's here and I'm here. I had to walk around to my son's side and help him and work with him and stop having this us and them mentality and stop working against him. So that might seem kind of obvious. At the time, it wasn't obvious. When you're in a situation, you don't, you, know, you can't see the wood for the trees. Um, so that was what I decided to do, was actually come around and help him. So at that point, I got a bit excited. I sprung into action. Um, I actually got my son some professional help, which turned out to be very, very useful. Um, I looked for books to read, educational books on this topic. There weren't many about at all at the time. I did find one. It was written by a child psychologist. Had a lot of useful information. It wasn't easy to read because she used a bit of jargon and you know, she wrote like a like doctor sort of term, medical terms a little bit. Um, but some good information. Since then, of course, I've written my book um how to keep children safe online couldn't enter into an addiction I and mean, i've intentionally written that um <clears throat> so that there is no jargon i just write i write as i talk so it's quite conversational um i think that's much needed 
Uh, I spent a lot of time on Google because what do we do if we have a problem? Of course, we Google it. Um, so I researched and I looked for a lot of information online. When you go online um, to look on information on any topic, it's generally a minefield. Um, and this is no different. There is so much information out there. In fact, um, there's really too much. And it's quite overwhelming to look through it all. And what can happen is you can get into a hole and you can go into one thing and the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, and then realise that you've been there for hours and you haven't actually really learned that much. Um, so I wasted a lot of time going through stuff online. Um, through that, though, I did find some good stuff. I found a lot of repetitive stuff, um, found a lot of not so useful stuff, but I did find some good stuff. And so I implemented what made sense to me um, and that helped a lot. I took an interest in the game of Pokemon, which is one thing that I hadn't been doing. Every time my son talked about it, I was like, no, I took the hand. I'm, I really could not care less about this game. I don't want to know about it. Um, and what I had to do was actually take more of an interest in that game. That had a big impact as well. Um, I meditated. I was just desperate to do anything. So through a whole combination of things, no, it wasn't through any one thing on its own, but through a whole combination of stuff, um, I learned how to communicate with my son. I learned how to get him back. And communication is key, and it was such a valuable process that I went through. Um, took a long time, but I got there in the end. So as a result, this is me, um, this is my son and I, um, things improved a lot. Uh, and it didn't take that long either. So uh, my son spent less time playing on games. But what, what was cool about that was that it wasn't because I was telling him not to play on the games. It was because he was happy to just naturally spend less time there, which was really cool. When it was time to get him off those games, we went from, like I said, the tantrums and the shaking fists and the red face and the yelling and screaming that we had before to like, okay, turn off the game. Like it just became a non-issue, which was a huge, huge turnaround. Um, I felt a lot more in control, a lot less overwhelmed. And because I had this extra knowledge that I could implement, um, I felt much more in control. And as a parent, um, I think we generally want to be in control. I don't know. I presume you'd like sort of to be in a little bit of control. As a parent, it's generally a very good thing. Um, and my son and I reconnected. Uh, we on a whole new level. We, um, we The relationship that we formed after that was probably better than what we had before the whole thing even started. So it was really quite positive. Um, so these days now we have, uh, like I said, have really strong um, relationships with both my boys. They do play games, as I said, but they play them in moderation. And balance really is the key, um, as well as playing the right games. They, my son has much better social skills. He has a much wider circle of friends because now he can talk to anyone. Now he's not blocking people out, um, which is really good. And the huge win that we had was when, I think it was his, must have been his seventh birthday. Um, it could have been eighth, but I think it might have been seven. must have been seven. Anyway, he had some money to spend and like for his birthday and he wanted to buy a Pokemon game, a DS game, 3DS game. And I allowed him to do that. So we walked into an EB game store and he had a look at all the games there and he saw the game that he wanted to buy um, and he had a look at it and then he looked and went, oh, you know what, I don't really want it anymore. And he walked out of the store with his money. Um, which was huge, huge, because there's no way that would have happened months before. There's absolutely no way that would have happened. Um, and that was him deciding not being told. So that was really cool. That's sort of how I know I knew for sure, well, now we're, now we're good. Now, now I've got him back and, and we're all under control again. So, uh, so after going through this whole experience, I'm a big believer um, that everything happens for a reason. Do you believe? Like everything happens for a reason, right? Sometimes... Uh, when things happen that are not so good, then it's a little bit harder to figure out what that reason is. But if you look hard enough, there is always a reason um, for, for everything. So after this all happened, I asked myself that question, well, why did we go through so much pain? And why did we go through such an awful um, period, I guess? You know, what was the reason for that? And, so, and I realised that through the process, through everything that I learned, uh, even though I took a lot of time to do it, I actually then had figured out how to cure internet addiction. Um, and I realised that I'm not really that special. My son wasn't that special. What we were going through is what so many families are going through more and more all the time. Um, it's huge in Australia. It's huge in the States. It's huge in most countries. Um, so I realised that I could put together what I'd learned and make it much 
provide a much easier, quicker, less painful process for other parents going through the same thing to get through to the other side where I got. Um, so I thought that might be a really useful thing. So hopefully, um, you know, I think that's really, really helpful. But then I thought why that like internet addiction or obsession is just one of the pitfalls of being online. There's also, there's so many others. There's, you know, predators and there's cyberbullying and there's sexting and there's porn and there's all the other issues that, that are being online, you know, monitoring, knowing what our kids are actually even doing there. Um, social media, this goes on. So I thought, what if I research, what if I turn my, my whole day job into researching the best of, the best information I can find on all the aspects of being safe online? And what if I spend all the time and put all that together, find out the best from the best people all over the world and put it all together in a way that, that goes, you know, here what, if you're a parent, here is what you absolutely need to know to keep your kids safe. And instead of taking the hundreds upon hundreds and I don't know how many hours to get that information that I've spent, collating it all, it's going to take you a fraction of the time. Absolute fraction of the time. If you do this yourself, it's going to take you way, way, way longer. Um, so that's what I've been doing uh, over the last few years is creating a way to make life so much easier for you and for other parents so that you can keep your kids safe online um, in a much shorter time frame. Um, than it would, would otherwise take. So that's the upside. Why I do this, I see so many families and I read so many stories and we're all well aware internet addiction is tearing families apart. It's not just tearing parents and kids, um, building walls between them, but also within siblings. So many so many kids, you know, like their heads are buried in the phone, so many adults and heads are buried in the phone. Um, so it's a real, real problem. It's not getting any smaller. Millions of innocent lives are being ruined by online activities. So many kids making so many mistakes. The same mistakes that we would have made when we were younger, back in the olden days. Um, but when we made them, no one else knew about them. The whole world didn't know about them. It wasn't made online. It was just made off, you know, physically in the physical world and a few people knew about it and then it all just blowed over. Um, that doesn't happen these days. And so many lives are being ruined. Things like hacking, you know, privacy is a big thing online. Or lack of it. Um, online predators are um, a big concern we'll talk about later. Social media mistakes are huge. Seeing porn is huge. Cyberbullying, sexting, all these problems that happen online um, tend to take kids through this path where you go down, um, you know, it starts with anxiety and then that, that turns into depression and then they look for drugs um, and then they start having suicidal thoughts and proceed down that path. What we need to do is stop that path in its tracks. If we can't prevent anxiety in the first place, then at least stop it at that point and don't let it go down that track. My key point is that all of the stuff, if not all of it, then the vast, vast majority, 99% of stuff, all the problems that happen as a result of being online can be avoided. It can all be avoided. So much pain can not happen. Um, and I know how to avoid it. And I know how to help you avoid it. And I think that that is just so, so important. That's what I'm um, dedicated towards. That's what I do. Um, and that's why I'm kind of passionate about all this stuff. So that's why I do what I'm doing. Five key problems that we are all facing as parents. Again, there's a lot more, but I'm only going to talk about five today because we only have so much time. This is the first one. Now, if you have a look at some of these posts, these are real... Uh, messages that kids are sending to each other, have sent to each other and get sent all the time. And I mean, it's nothing new. Kids being mean to each other is nothing new. Kids have always been mean to each other forever. Um, but of course, now they've got another platform, different ways to be mean and the meanness has gone to a completely new scale. What do you think? I, I show this picture to, uh, to kids in year three, four, five and six. I have a guess what they how they respond. Because as me as a mum, when I look at these, my first thought is, oh my goodness, I hope that my kids never receive a message like this. My second thought is, I certainly hope my kids don't ever send a message like this. That's just as bad. But kids, when they see this, their initial response, and I reckon 80 to 90% of them do this, they laugh. They think it's hilarious. When I then talk to them a little bit more, 
and get them to actually imagine, well, how might they actually feel if they received a message like this? Then would it be funny? They, they realise that actually maybe it's not that funny. But initially, they all think it's just funny. I think that's kind of interesting. So cyberbullying, 50 to 80% of school children are involved in cyberbullying most regularly. So when I say they're involved, they are either a victim, um, they get bullied online, they bully others online, or in what happens in a lot of cases, they see it, they're the bystanders. A lot of bystanders of cyberbullying sort of get forgotten in this, but they can be really badly affected, and I'll talk more about that um, you know, a little bit, but it's, it's very stressful when you're seeing someone being bullied online. You want to stop it happening. You want to you want to help the person being bullied, but you don't want to get involved. You don't want the bully to turn on you as well. So it's a very, very stressful situation. Three Australians commit suicide each week. They're not all kids. Some of those are, are adults, but they're committing suicide as a result of cyberbullying. That's just huge. Um, in the States, it's, in the US, it's 4,500 people a year committing suicide from cyberbullying, which is 86 or something um, on average a week, which is just horrendous. Obviously, everything's bigger in the States. Um, but here, you know, three Australians, that's just, that's insane. It's way too many. Way too many. One a year is too many. Um, vast majority of victims don't tell their parents, and in fact, 90%, it's around 90% of kids, don't tell their parents if they're being bullied. And that is a huge part of the problem. Because how can you help them if you don't know what's happening? That's a massive, massive issue. And parents think of the kids that who are bullied. Parents think that they would know that they that their parent, that their kids would tell them, but the fact is that your kids are not. Okay, so there's a very, very good chance that if your kids do get bullied, um, your kids will not tell you about it. Several reasons for that, and I won't go into now, but there's lots of reasons for it. So I want to talk about a guy, a boy called Ryan Halligan, such a sweetie. So his, Ryan was described as uh, sweet, gentle and lanky, incredible sense of humour, friendly. He was a sort of boy who he'd walk into a room and everyone would just be happy. He would just light up the mood and everyone would just kind of have to smile because he was there. Um, really lovely boy. He was bullied from year five quite badly, really badly. Um, the reasons why, a lot, a lot of kids don't really need much reason could be anything. In his case, it was uh, because he had full, poor physical coordination. He was a bit unco. Um, and he didn't. He had some learning difficulties. And as a result, he didn't do that well in school. Um, kids are bullied for anything. They're bullied for, you know, for the type of hair they've got, for their whatever, for their appearance, for their background, for their who knows what. Certainly um, LGBT, for, you know, lesbian, gay, whatever. Um, there's so many reasons for kids to be bullied. Some kids are bullied because they're, because they're too pretty, because other kids think that they shouldn't be so pretty or shouldn't be so good looking or whatever. So it doesn't take much. Um, in Ryan's case, his parents, when he was bullied at school, his, their initial response was, you know what, Ryan, they're just words, you know, the whole sticks and stones, break your bones thing. Um, they're not true. Just ignore them. They're not, you know, you know you're better than that. Just don't worry about it. Um, and that comes from a place of love, okay? Obviously, they, they knew that he didn't deserve to be bullied. No one deserves to be bullied like that. Um, and so they did what they, what they could. What happened after that, in a little while, um, Ryan actually, his dad, um, taught him martial arts. They did a bit of a karate kid thing. And I can't remember what, which martial art it was, but whatever it was, um, his dad taught him how to fight and how to defend himself. And he got into a fight with this boy who was the leader of the, this gang in fight that was bullying him quite a lot. Um, they actually got into a physical fight. And because Ryan had been taught by his dad to defend himself, he actually did okay in the fight. Um, and he gained a lot of self-confidence out of that. And, um, and after that happened, he wasn't physically put, picked on anymore. And the bully actually um, friended him or pretended to friend him. Um, this kind of concerned Ryan's family. They weren't real sure about it. But anyway, Ryan thought, no, it's okay, Dad, you know, now he's my friend. Um, but the reason he, he wanted to be his friend was to get personal information out of him so that he could then spread that everywhere and make Ryan's life a living hell. Um, so that's what happened. The friend spread this uh, gay rumour. Now, if, he, if Ryan had been gay, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as it happens, he wasn't. But... Um, at that point in time, being gay certainly was considered um, 
not a good thing, I guess. And so people taunted him and harassed him really badly um, because of this rumour that wasn't true. So he had, uh, after that, he, he started a, a relationship online with this girl. Um, things seemed to be going quite nicely there. Maybe it was a, as a, uh, in an attempt to quash the, the gay rumours. Um, after a while, after he thought everything was fine, um, she told him in front of all of her friends, you know what, you're just a loser. I never really liked you anyway. Um, and she turned on him as well, which at that point in time, like, enough's enough. You can only take so much as a poor kid. She also spread private messages that she'd had with him just to really humiliate um, him, which worked. At this point in time, he's 13 years old, you know, I'm done. Um, and committed suicide. Now, the effect on Ryan's dad was huge. Well, the effect on all of Ryan's family and, of course, on the whole community will be huge. And I want you to just think that this can happen to anyone, okay? This could, have, this could happen to me. This could happen to you. You know, so many kids are bullied. It's not, it's not an uncommon thing. We just said three Australians can commit suicide each week because of this. Um, Ryan's dad is this amazing, amazing guy. He actually does talks... Um, in the States, he, he goes around to schools and he talks to students um, and most of the students are just, in, you know, there's never a dry eye after he, when he's talking. Um, he shares his story in the hope that others will, will not, um, you know, do the wrong thing and cause other people to commit suicide. Um, so I want to just talk about, this is a quote that Ryan, uh, that John Halligan, Ryan's dad, um, says. I'm just going to read it to you. So he says, it is painful to be bullied and humiliated in front of a few kids. It is painful to feel rejection and have your heart crushed by a girl. But it has to be an entirely different experience of pain than a generation ago when these hurts and humiliations are witnessed by a far larger online adolescent audience. I believe my son would have survived these incidents of bullying and humiliation if they took place before computers and the internet. It's made it all so much worse. I think many of us would not have had the resiliency and stamina to sustain such a nuclear level attack on our feelings and reputation as a young teen in the midst of rapid social, uh, physical, social and emotional cha changes. Okay, so even as an adult, that would have been a lot for us to take. As a teenager, teens are going through so much. They want so much to belong. There's so much peer pressure on them. They can't take, they can't take this. It's just too much. Okay, I believe technology, so he goes on to say, I believe technology has the effect of accelerating and amplifying the hurt to levels that will probably result in a rise in teen suicide rates until we figure out how to address it with a stronger standard of coping skills. I've highlighted that because this is what it's about. It's about we need to be giving our kids a stronger standard of coping skills. They need to be resilient. They need to be able to handle stuff that's going to happen to them, which is going to be a lot worse now than it was before because it's all happening online. The recent statistics indicate that indeed adolescent mental health problems are on the rise. Many experts tie it to the dramatic increased use of smartphone use by teenagers over the past several years. Some describe it as being hyper-connected to an unhealthy level. Try taking a smartphone away from a teenager and you will often quickly discover an addiction problem, right? So if you have a teen or have a young child or, or like in my case, you, you take a 3DS away from them or an iPad away from them or tell them to go off the computer, you know if you've got a problem. In the final analysis, we feel that Ryan's middle school social media environment was toxic, like for so many young people across this country. So he's talking about the United States, but it doesn't matter what country you're in. Certainly in Australia, it's the same. In most countries, it's the same. In the UK. For too long, we have let kids and adults bully each other as a rite of passage into adulthood. But the internet has taken this to a whole new dangerous level. However, we place accountable for this tragedy first and foremost ourselves as parents. Here's the really tragic part of this. So Ryan, when you hear Ryan's dad, John Halligan, talk, he says he's forgiven soon after all this happened, um, which is a few years ago now, he, he's forgiven the boy who was the lead, that lead bully um, that was you know, harassing him from year five. He's forgiven the girl and she was really the final straw. And he says, you know what, they both made some mistakes. They're both children who made mistakes. He's forgiven them. The two people that he can't forgive are himself and his wife. And every day he wakes up and thinks, you know what, what if we'd done this? What if we'd done more? What if we'd 
gone to the school? What if we'd learnt more? What if we knew what we were doing a bit better? What if we, whatever. Every day he's living with his guilt, him and his wife, because they think that they're responsible for it. I don't want this to happen to you. This is just, you know, you don't wish that on anyone. As parents, we fail to assess adequately and maintain an emotionally healthy school social environment for our son while he was alive. Clearly, this was not solely the school's responsibility. So it's easy for us to go, well, the school's responsible if, if your child's being bullied. If it's happening at school or by kids at school, then it's their responsibility. When it's cyberbullying, it's often not happening at school. Of course, it's happening after school. It's happening on their screens. But we cannot hold schools fully accountable. Yes, schools have a responsibility, certainly, to do something about bullying. There's no doubt about that. But it's not just them. They cannot be 100% responsible. We as parents have to take responsibility for this and work through it with our children. So important. Okay, here's the last thing I want to share with you, a quote from, from John Halligan. We also should have openly discussed the emerging technology and the potential social pitfalls, along with how to protect oneself and cope emotionally in this new environment. Now, I put that in red because here's the reason that I do what I do. Okay, I, actually, I only found this quote um, fairly recently, so I started doing what I'm doing well before I saw this, but this is the reason that I share the information that I share because of what he's just said there. We should have openly discussed the emerging technology and the potential social pitfalls along with how to protect oneself and cope emotionally in this new environment. We have to be having these conversations with our kids and what I do, what I'm offering, what I can do for you um, is help you do exactly that. It's not as easy as it seems. I don't know if it seems, seems easy, um, but it's not that easy to do, but it can be done. Um, and it's so important to do that. You don't want to end up, you know, in this situation. It's, it's pretty, pretty tragic. So my key tip, I'm just going to share a quick key tip um, with each of these problems that we're facing is to be approachable. Your children need to feel like they can approach you no matter what. They need to be that 10% of child who is going to let you know if they're being bullied. Um, it's not easy to do that, but it is really important to do that. So that's a real key to help with cyberbullying. It only gets bad because it doesn't get stopped. It doesn't get nipped in the bud and it very quickly becomes very bad online. Okay, problem number two, social media. Uh, so more than half of kids aged 10 are using social media. Uh, a lot of kids are using it under age. A lot of parents, sometimes parents know they're using it. Often parents don't know they're using it. Um, it's pretty easy to get on there when you're under age, pretty easy to lie about, about how old you are. Um, kids 10 years old, you know, 9 years old, 10, 11, 12, they do not have the emotional intelligence to be safe on social media. They just don't have it. Their brains are just not formed um, and things will happen. Things do happen all the time. One in five children override social media settings. Ideally, they should be using the highest privacy settings. A lot of kids uh, don't do that. Um, even using the highest privacy settings, still can, things can still be shared. An old stat, this is an old stat that says 7.5 million Facebook users are under age. Now, kids these days, some of them do use Facebook, um, much more so they're on other platforms like Snapchat and Instagram and Kick and all sorts of other places. Um, and it doesn't matter what platform they're on. All of those main platforms, the minimum age is 13. Um, and on all of them, there are a lot of people on there who are not 13. Um, who are just lying about it. It's not that hard to do. And that's a real problem. 43% of kids aged 12 and up uh, message strangers online. So a lot of them um, are contacted by strangers online. A lot of them are actually writing back and forming a relationship with people that they don't know online. It could be anyone. And we say to our kids, I mean, most of us, you probably say to your kids, don't talk, you know, don't talk to strangers or you don't know, they might not be who they think who you think they are. Um, and that sort of goes in one ear and out the other with most kids. So a girl called Hannah Smith, she was a young girl, I think 13. She looked for advice on eczema. She must have had some eczema. She looked for advice on ask.fm. Don't know if you've heard of ask. It's one of the worst uh, social media platforms. It's completely anonymous. Um, you just you can ask a question and people will just anonymously answer you. As a result of this question, somehow that led to her being taunted. She got in, she was insulted about her weight and about a family death, um, which kind of doesn't seem to flow on. I don't know how that happens, but this weird stuff happens on Ask and happens on a lot of these platforms, and that's what we need to be aware of. 
she doesn't look overweight. In the pictures you see of her, she certainly doesn't look overweight, so I don't know what that was all about. She was even urged by bullies to drink bleach and cut herself on ask because she had eczema. Go figure. She wrote it uh, in her journal. As I sit here day by day, I wonder if it's going to get better. I want to die. I want to be free. I can't live like this anymore. I'm not happy. Um, this, you know, 13-year-old shouldn't be, shouldn't be going through this. At 14 years, she was done. She hung herself in her bedroom and her oldest sister found her. Can you imagine what that would be like? I mean, I can't even contemplate if you were to walk into your child's room and find them hanging there or lying on a bed with a packet of pills or something empty. But for a sister to see that, I goodness, goodness knows how much counselling and whatever she would have to have. Um, it's not something she's going to forget. Days later, this is what really gets me too. Days later, abusive messages mocking the loss appeared on Facebook. So after things like this happen that are just too tragic for, you know, to even really think about, people are mocking it. People are making jokes online. Like the cruelty, the level of cruelty that happens online is just truly out of this world. So my key tip is safe social media use is to be a mentor for your children it is so important they need your help every child needs your help even if they are 13 even if they are legally allowed to be there they need your help to mentor them so that they can use social media safely and navigate it and know how to use it okay they know how to navigate social media in terms of they know how to swipe and how to post a message and put an image there they know how to do that the tech side of it what they don't know is how to be safe there. And that's where it's really important to know how to mentor them and to be there and hold their hand. Okay, so problem three is sexting or your kids don't really know what sexting is. They won't, well, they won't call it sexting. Kids call it, and you know, parents like us call it sexting. Kids call it nudes. Well, there's other words for it, sending nudes. If you talk to your child about sending nudes, they know what you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about sexting, they may not. So sending nudes or sexting is considered normal behaviour. Everyone's doing it right, so it must be okay. Um, and there's that peer pressure thing going on for kids and tweens and teens. Boys and girls as young as 10 are sending these images, some younger again. So this is not something that's, that is just happening in high school or for teenagers. This is happening before that, well before that. Uh, one in five Australians are victims of image-based abuse. Now, image-based abuse is a very broad term and encompasses uh, a whole lot of things. It's sextortion, it's um, children being abused and being paid um, to be abused and people watching it on video. It's just the um, images uh, or videos being spread, being seen um, without their consent. Um, it actually is, is quite a wide, broad range of things. But one in five Australians are victims of this which is huge, which is really, really big. A lot of people being affected. Good, good chance that someone in your family will be affected. Doesn't matter how old they are, doesn't matter if they're male or female. The standard response, do you know if you're aware what the standard response is to, if someone sends your child an image of themselves, a new image, what are they supposed to do? The response, if you're a child, somebody sends you one, you show me yours, you show me, um, what is it? Show me yours, I'll show you mine. Um, the standard response is to respond with an image of yourself. So somebody sends you an image, you're supposed to send them an image. It's similar. Um, a lot of people do do this, very often at least to cyberbullying. Uh, it's an invitation for predators. It's like putting a sign on your head, hey, predators, and you're disgusting, disgusting people in this world, pick me. Um, it's... You know, predators love these images. They love them. They share them. They have thousands and thousands of those images. Um, and they seek out, often seek out these kids in real life. Sexual exploitation of kids is increasing massively. It's spiralling out of control. Um, in the last four years, from 2013 to, to 2017, there's been a 700% increase in indecent images online they are just everywhere they've gone completely through the roof because people think it's normal and it's no big deal and everyone else is doing it what's the problem um so a girl called hope witzel she looks so sweet and innocent beautiful picture um she sent a nude image to a boy that she liked 
another girl found um, this picture on the boy's phone and spread it. And this is really interesting because she might have trusted this boy and she could have been right to trust him because he didn't actually do the wrong thing. But when kids have phones, everyone's going to see one else's phones. They all see each other's. So um, even though the boy might have been okay, it wasn't him that spread it. It was someone else who spread it. Um, of course, it wasn't there in the first place. It wouldn't have been spread. But um, as a result of that image being spread, Hope was taunted and bullied really badly. She was called all sorts of names. Um, she wrote an entry in her journal. She said, tons of people talk to me behind my back and I hate it because they call me a whore and I can't be. I'm too inexperienced. So secretly, tons of people hate me. This poor girl, like, how, how sweet and innocent does she sound? She seems like, you know, she just made a silly mistake, which is very common, which an awful lot of kids are making. Good chance that our, your, your kids are going to make these mistakes. That are, an awful lot of them do. So Hope was suspended from school because she shared an image of herself, which was a porn pornographic image. That's distribution of pornography, which is illegal. So she got suspended herself for a couple of weeks. When she came back, she, there were cuts on her legs, um, which the teacher saw. She went to the school counsellor. The counsellor made her agree to tell an adult if she felt like self-harming herself, and she agreed to that. And then the next day she hung herself in a bedroom. Um, these are just, you know, tragic, tragic stories that where these instances, this, this can be, um, this could have been avoided. You know, this can be your child. This can be avoided. It has to be avoided. Okay, you need to take action to make sure this doesn't happen um, to you or to anyone that you know or to anyone else, everyone. <laughs> so key tip with sexting, educate your children so that they don't want to sext. Telling them not to send a nude image of themselves is not enough. Okay, a lot of the kids who send these images have been told not to and they will do it anyway. Um, they have to not want to do it for themselves, which, which uh, requires education around this and a lot of communication. Okay, next problem, online predators. Um, there's around about 750,000 predators online at any one time. That could be a conservative figure. It's very hard to tell um, accurately, but that's the, um, the belief. That's what's out there roughly at any one time. Where are they? They are everywhere that is online. They're in chat rooms, they're in games, um, they're on social networking sites, um, instant messaging platforms, and they're online. They are very clever and they are very manipulative. Kids, particularly tweens, think they're pretty smart, they think they're pretty savvy, um, but these guys are really smart. All girls, more often guys and girls, but they are very, very clever. Um, and that's why what they do works. Kids think that they know the dangers, but they don't fully understand. So it's difficult, with, particularly when they become teens, they think they know it all. Um, they don't fully understand. If they did, again, the stories that we hear and all these tragic things wouldn't be happening, wouldn't be a problem. One in five children um, receive sexual solicitations from um, these creeps online. 22% of targets are between 10 and 13 years old. I think that's really relevant because we tend to think actually that it's teens. This happens to teens um, and it does happen to teens. They do of course teenagers get contacted by predators, but it happens before that. So it's interesting that more than one in five of the targets are not all, are very early teen, just become a teen, but they're 10, 11, 12 years old. So this happens younger than we think. 69% um, of teens who are contacted don't tell their parents. So again, um, kids don't like telling us what is going on online if they're having a problem. They'll chat with strangers and they'll chat with people who are not who they, who they don't know who they are or they think they're one person, they're really quite another um, and they won't tell you about it. So this uh, girl, her name is Casey, Casey Woody. She met a guy called David Fuller in a Christian chat room when she was 13 years old. He was 47 pretending to be 18. Interestingly, a lot of predators now don't lie about their age. A lot of them say how old they are um, and a lot of them are much older than the people that they're talking to. Um, and part of the excitement in talking to them is the fact that they are older. So a lot of them don't, don't actually lie. Um, in this case, he, he, this guy was lying. He was pretending to be 18. Um, they courted before. Uh, they went out online before. Casey broke up with him for someone else. No big deal. Happens all the time, right? Um, but Fuller, this guy knew a lot about Casey. He knew her movements because when they'd been going out, she taught him a lot of stuff. So she, he knew where she was. 
when, what she did, where she was going to be, when she was going to be there. He knew way too much information. Her friends worried that she'd share too much, but it was too late because she'd already shared it. She didn't think it was a big deal. This guy, Fuller, abducted her when he knew that she was going to be home alone. Physically knew where she was, dragged her into a minivan, raped and killed her. Um, so, yeah, just another tragic story that could have been avoided. Could have been avoided. Um, key tip to avoid predators is to understand them. When you understand how predators operate, and it's really important that you understand how they operate and that your kids, your child or your children understand how they operate because you can see them a mile off if you know what you're looking for. Kids don't know what they're looking for and they won't see it. They won't spot it. Okay, the last problem I want to talk about is, of course, inappropriate content online, how much there, there is an awful lot of this. So the average age to see porn, and this really shocks me, it used to be 11. For a long time, it's been about 11. Um, but I read, and I read an article fairly recently that it's gone down to nine, nine years old. That is so young to be seeing such inappropriate content. And that's the average age. That means that some kids are seeing it much younger than nine. Some kids are lucky and they're not seeing it until they're older than that. Obviously, that's why it's an average a lot of the reason kids see it so young is if you have more than one child, those of you who have more than one child, um, the younger one is going to see more at a younger age because they're going to see what the older, they're going to be exposed to what the older child is seeing. So my kids, 10 and 7, my 7-year-old is going to see more at the age of 7 than my older one would have at 7 because he's seeing what a 10-year-old is seeing. So 82% of kids are exposed to inappropriate material online before age 11 that's a lot that's four out of five if you have a child is a that very very good chance they're going to see something inappropriate online so we need to know what to do about this kids learn the problem is that when kids see porn online they're seeing that before they've seen sex or before they understand what sex is or have this have the sex talk um, and so they just assume that that is normal behavior they think that porn is sex they don't get the difference they think that the girls think that that's just what sex is. That's just what they are supposed to do. The boys think that that's okay to treat girls like that. That's normal. And um, it's just, yeah, it's just what they're supposed to do. They start viewing girls as, as sexual objects um, as opposed to real people with real feelings who deserve to be treated with respect. Um, in the, you know, like I say, the girls don't realise that well, they should be treating their bodies with a lot more respect than themselves. The worst thing is that some kids, because they think it's normal, um, they then copy what they see and they then abuse other kids. You know, kids as young as five and four and six being abused is just terrific. Uh, so here's a story, a true story, a lady called Jane. She's a mum in Tassie, Tasmania. She discovered her seven and nine-year-old sons had accessed porn online. She says, I wasn't expecting it to be a conversation with children that young. I thought it would be a teenage conversation. It was a reality check about the world we live in. And I think that's so real and that's so true. And, of course, we don't expect to be having these conversations so young. And I know most parents freak out about talking about sex the way it's supposed to be when their kids are that young. Um, and they don't think that should happen until their kids are, you know, in year six or whatever. That is way too late. These conversations has, have to happen, unfortunately, um, a lot sooner than you think. And they have to include more content than you think or than you would like. So my key tip for inappropriate content is to porn-proof your children. It is possible to porn-proof them. Um, and I talk, that's what I, I can help you do. Um, not right now, this minute, but I certainly can help you porn-proof your children. I have porn-proof mine. Um, and it gives me a lot of peace of mind. Okay, so I said I was going to talk about three mistakes that parents make so that you don't make them. Mistake number one is waiting till it's too late, the ship sailed, um, waiting till kids are in high school, you know, I'll worry about that then when I know that there's a real issue. What I'm trying to get through and hopefully I've gotten through is that it's not an issue then, well it is an issue then, but it's an issue now. Okay, if your kids are eight, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, it's an issue for you now. Um, please don't wait until it's too late. This is about prevention is better than a cure. Prevention is so much better than a cure, much, much easier. Um, and to prevent something going wrong, you've really got to be on this sooner than later. Nearly half of six-year-olds are browsing the internet online. So 
you know, if you're young kids, they probably are online. Um, they're as savvy as 10 year olds were three years ago. So kids are accessing things younger than ever. They are smarter than ever in terms of being tech savvy. Um, they can figure out their way around these things. Six year olds, some, not all obviously, but some six year olds are using social media already. Um, they're streaming content and they're uploading their own videos to YouTube. So um, Messenger, Facebook Messenger for Kids has just been released. That is targeting kids from six years old, six to 12 year olds. Uh, you know, streaming content, uh, watching videos is one thing. All of our kids are watching videos on YouTube. Um, it's the most popular site that all kids are watching. But the scary thing is that they're not just watching other people's videos, but they're actually creating their own and posting them live or posting them on YouTube. Some of them are live videos. Um, they're sharing stuff that is really giving away way too much information and it makes them so vulnerable. And most parents don't know, don't know that they're doing it. It's just what kids are doing now. It's fun. Again, they're not doing it to be naughty at all. It's just a fun thing that kids are doing and we have to be on top of this. Eight-year-olds are sharing personal details. Again, they're not all sharing personal details, but a lot of them are. Um, details such as the home address, their full name, surname, um, phone number, their date of birth, uh, way too much information that makes them vulnerable in the real world. And so where we also distinguish um, between being online and offline, kids don't. The online world is part of their world. It's just a part of what they do. It's not an off online, offline thing. So where we sort of separate the two, kids don't. It's just all the one world. Um, and they're sharing their details there. Um, if you have a nine-year-old daughter, be listening up to this, um, here's another story why I shouldn't wait. A nine-year-old girl, she started her own YouTube channel. She posted her first video within 45 minutes. Doesn't take long. Right? They're pretty tech savvy. This video featured her dancing naked in her bedroom and she posted it to YouTube. Although the video was pulled by YouTube after 35 minutes, over 100 people viewed it and 45 of those shared it. Now, she didn't, this, a nine-year-old girl doesn't post this video to be naughty or to do the wrong thing. She just does it because it's fun. Now, I wish, I wish that 100 people would view my videos in 45 minutes. Because of the type of content it is, these videos just go viral in no time. And, you know, almost half of the people who saw it shared it. So how many, you know, creeps and predators and God knows what already saw this video. Now, I think that this was an impressive effort from YouTube. I think that they did a pretty good effort to take that down after 35 minutes. Um, often it would be there a lot longer than that. And that damage was happening really fast. Okay, and that is another thing that could easily have been avoided, um, which is why I keep going back to let's avoiding, let, avoid these things from happening. Um, you have to take some action to make sure that your kids don't make these mistakes. They're very, very common. Second mistake, won't happen to me. My kids are smart. My kids are responsible. My kids are popular. My kids are sporty. Uh, my kids are savvy. My kids live in a good area. Um, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. This is happening to all sorts of kids. Doesn't matter how many friends they have. Doesn't matter what they look like. Um, it doesn't matter. This can happen to you. This can happen to anyone. The third mistake is just not going far enough, not understanding, and this is very common, not understanding what it takes to keep your kids truly safe online. Most parents, 99.9% .9 of parents do not know what it takes. Um, and they think that what they're doing is probably enough. They think, you know, they're telling kids don't talk to strangers online. They think, well, that's enough. I've already told my kids not to talk to strangers online and they know that, so they're not gonna do it. So everything's okay. There is so much more to this. Um, and so not knowing what it takes is really, really common. So at this point, uh, this is where I, I ask, well, do you want to know, is it okay to share with you um, how I can actually help, a way that you can actually get some help with all this? Um, so let's talk about what solution may look like for you. And that's the good news that there is a solution, that it's not just, it kind of seems like such an, oh my gosh, this is such a big problem. Um, but there is help out there for you. It's important that you know that. Um, so just to put, again, this into perspective, online safety, I see it as 
like a puzzle. You see it as a, it's like a hundred piece puzzle. There are so many parts to this and there are a lot of, um, it all needs to sort of come together. So of the hundred pieces of the puzzle, it's really important that you have all the pieces of the puzzle and that you know where they fit and then you can put them all in place. That's what's going to keep your kids safe. Having 20 pieces of the puzzle and thinking that you're okay um, is leaving kids vulnerable to so many risks and so many other things that might happen when they're online. And you don't want to stop them being online. Plenty of cool stuff happens online. There's some awesome games. Um, there's some really good things that can happen online. They, you know, it's a good way to, well, it's a way to stay in touch with people that you wouldn't otherwise stay in touch with. There are definitely benefits for kids, obvious educational benefits um, to being online. So we don't want to stop them being there. Um, but it is important that you have all the pieces of the puzzle. And so um, one of the things that I can do for you is give you those pieces of the puzzle and let you know where they fit. So um, this, and this is not something that I'm, is actually available today. I just want to let you know I'm, I'm not trying to push this. I'm, I'm not trying to sell it today. It's not even available. Um, but what I am doing is letting you know what's out there um, and what is possible and what you can work towards if you want to. So it's called the Peaceful Digital Parenting Solution. What this is, is I've, I've gone, okay, here is a complex problem. There's quite a lot to it. I'm going to make this, I'm going to turn, uh, take this sort of complex problem. I'm going to make it as easy as possible um, for parents to get on top of this and for, to get the information that you absolutely need um, without any more that you don't need, without wasting any time um, to keep the kids safe online. So I've broken it down into three um, steps, which is three key things that are so important. Communication is probably the most important thing. Um, so it's about helping you communicate effectively with your kids and opening those lines of communication with them. It's about learning what you need to know without knowing everything that you don't need to know um, that will keep your kids safe. And it's about collaborating, of course, implementing what you learn effectively with your kids. Um, so that they can be safe. So um, complex problem, simplified solution. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about, so what, what this does for you is this takes you on a journey and it is a bit of a journey. Um, it takes a few weeks to get there. But we take you from the point of, instead of being concerned and a little bit scared, oh gosh, are they, my kid's going to get in trouble, what are they going to see or what are they going to do when they're online? to having peace of mind that they're okay because they can navigate themselves safely. And if they see something that isn't right or something goes wrong, then they'll come to you about it or they'll know how to deal with it. So it's not going to have a negative effect on them. That's the key. So this is about going, you know, often we sort of feel so overwhelmed with technology about going from that point to having a lot, a lot more knowledge um, and confidence. And that's where we can feel in much more in control as a parent um, and as I said before, we want to have some sort of control parents and most parents just have absolutely no control, unfortunately, of what kids are getting up to online. Uh, and it's also about strengthening your relationship with your kids. So if you're in a situation like I was or stopping you getting to that situation where you have the barrier between you and you're not speaking the same language um, or everybody's, you know, when you're in the same room together, no one's actually talking to each other because you're all staring at your own screens. It's about gaining a much stronger and better relationship with your kids. So pretty cool benefits that come from this. What it's really about, um, it's not about me, definitely. It's not um, really about you. It is about your children, but it's not even just about your children. And I want to give you an example here. So I've got here, it's about giving your children the life skills they need to protect themselves and their friends online. What this is about, I'm going to give you a scenario. Let's imagine that your uh, your child is in a class, someone in their class at school is being bullied online and your child can see it happening. They're not the ones doing the bullying, but they can see it happening. They don't want to say anything, don't want to get involved, kind of do want to help, but they just don't know what to do. So they just kind of see it and don't do anything. Um, but it does affect them. It stresses them out. Meanwhile, the bullying online gets worse and worse and worse and they're seeing it all the time. The child who's being bullied eventually gets to the point where they go, you know what? There's no escape from this. I'm not, I can't take this anymore. And they've had enough. They commit suicide. This is happening every week. This is happening all the time. Now, imagine the effect that will have on your child. So your child isn't the one being bullied. They're not the ones doing the bullying, but they saw it. They made a choice not to do anything about it. And now someone is not alive anymore. 
they've committed suicide. How is your child going to be affected by that? Your child is not going to forgive themselves. They're going to feel so guilty. They're not going to forget that this person was alive in their class and now they're not there anymore. They're not going to forget that. So this is going to have a huge effect on your child. This, this thing is, you know, if someone commits suicide, if a child dies at all, it has a massive effect on a whole community, not just the parents and family, but obviously a much wider community. That's if they die. But when they commit suicide, then you've got the guilt that goes with it. It's like the whole thing, well, what if, what if this had happened like, like John Halligan's going through? What if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? It's so much worse. Your child might stop that from happening to someone else. So like I've said here, this is about a whole community. This is not just about your, your children. Obviously, it's going to affect you a thousand times more if it is your child that's being bullied. Um, but even if it's not them directly being bullied, this is going to have a massive effect on your child's life and all their friends' lives. So this is about saving lives. Um, I've said this before, the reason that I talk about communication a lot and why I think it's, why well, I know that it's the most important thing is because most kids won't tell you if they're being cyberbullied or any other problem happens online, they won't let you know. So the key here is to open the lines of communication, break down all the barriers so that you know that your child will be one of the 10%, will be one of the few who will tell you what's going on and that then opens up the opportunity so that you can help them and you can guide them to be safe online. So I'll tell you a story about um, why the communication is so important. And true story, uh, there's a mum had a son who was 12 years old and he's six at school. He went to school one day like normal. One of his friends had a mobile phone, unrestricted access on the phone, um, had found a video of some porn who thought it was pretty funny. He showed this lady's son um, I'll call him David, the boy. Um, actually, normally I, I call them not their real names just to protect them, but so I call them Mum Sharon and the, and the boy David. Anyway, so David sees this video of porn on his friend's phone, not really interested in it, hadn't seen it before, didn't really want to see it, but if he walked away, he would have been called names and then what's your problem? Um, it hassled a bit. So he, anyway, he watched this video, um, it was a bit ugh, grossed out by it. The boy who showed him the video, he thought it was really cool, gave him the address, gave him like the URL, the address of where to find the video. He said, hey, mate, you know, if you want to see it again, that's where it is. And put this address in, in the guy's pocket. And, you know, David's like, you know, okay, whatever. Wasn't ever going to look at it again. Or at that point, certainly had no intention of doing so. Um, anyway, the school day ends, he goes home. Mum's um, there, Sharon's there. How's your day? Dave, yeah, good, everything fine. Yeah, all's good. Um, Kids at that age don't tell you that much yet. Yeah, everything's fine yet. Um, then takes his jacket off. Sharon goes to wash his jacket and finds this address of this, what was obviously a pornographic website. Um, you could tell from the name of it, uh, in David's pocket. So she starts freaking out as you do <laughs> and sort of is going, thinking to herself, oh my gosh, what do I do, what do I do? Uh, kind of really wish I was prepared. I like, I don't know what to do anyway. She calms herself down a little bit, <laughs> tries to compose herself and goes, hey, David, what's this? And shows him the piece of paper with the address in it. David freaks out. David just loses it. He goes, oh, my gosh, it was horrible. I didn't want to see it. I didn't know what to do. It was disgusting and I feel really dirty and I wish I hadn't seen it. And, and he starts, he just has a bit of a breakdown. Um, he actually is in tears because he's so upset by what he's seen. And now he's embarrassed because his mum knows that he's seen something like this. So my point of sharing this with you is that this mum was, Sharon was given a gift at that point in time. She didn't see it as a gift at the time, but she was given a gift because she had the opportunity to help him, to communicate with him about what he'd seen. 99% of the time, that's not going to happen. Your child will see the scenario of seeing it on someone else's phone at school is very, very common. What's not common is that you know that it's happened because no child, your kids are not going to come running home from school saying, hey, mum, hey, dad, guess what I saw today? Okay, this is not going to happen. Um, so she was given the opportunity of actually knowing what had happened. But here's the thing. I want to ask you the question, how would you respond? If this was you, how would you respond? Because your response at that point in time and you're going to be on the spot without time to prepare is going to make your child much more likely, it's going to break down those barriers of communication, make them much more likely 
to share with you if something happens. Um, or if it's not the right response, it's going to make them highly unlikely to ever share anything with you. And the natural response is probably going to do the latter. Um, so it's very, very important that you know how to respond before it happens because when it does happen, you're going to be on the spot and you're not going to have time to research it. So this is about knowing how to respond well before anything happens so that you can be prepared, so that you can be that better parent, so you can be the parent that your child will confide in if they need to. Um, another story, and this is where you know, I talk about the three steps are communication and um, learning and collaborating. So this is where um, if parents have learned a lot more, again, another situation that could definitely have been avoided, and um, you'll see why it should have been avoided with this story. So um, again, true story, three eight-year-old girls in year three at school, best of friends, perfectly normal, happy girls at one of their homes one day um, just to have a play, have a play day um, in one of the girls' bedrooms, um, whose house it was. The girl had a device in her room, she had a computer or an iPad or something uh, that had unlimited, unrestricted internet access saw a video, a pornographic video of three women doing pornographic things and they thought it looked like fun, didn't really understand it, but they thought it looked like fun video. So they thought that they might just create their own video. And so they did that and all three stripped off their clothes and copied what they'd seen done in this video and made their own video, recorded themselves and posted it online on social media because they were eight years old, they thought it was fun, they were savvy enough to know how to create a video and post it online and they were on social media. That went to docs, um, school got involved and docs, Department of Children's Services got involved. And again, my question is how would you feel? Now, these the mums of these three girls were obviously completely shocked. None of them didn't occur to them for a second that that's what the girls were doing in, in this bedroom. And I mean, if you have a daughter, this can happen with girls. It could happen with boys do the same thing. Um, and I want you to think, what if, what if this was your daughter? These girls were eight years old. Um, and this could have been avoided from happening in so many ways. There's no reason that this should have happened. Okay. This is why I'm getting that message across again, that you need to take action so that this doesn't happen to you, so that your daughter is not doing these things um, because you just need to avoid that at all costs. The, the effects that that's going to have on these girls' lives, they, you know, again, they don't have the emotional intelligence. They have no clue. They're certainly not considering the consequ any, you know, consequences of their actions at all. So what do you need to learn? Enough. You need to learn enough to guide your children to be safe. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to out um, savvy your children. Your kids are going to be more tech savvy than you probably at a young age. If they're not already, um, that's normal. They're called digital natives. They don't know the world without screens and swipey things and that's just what they do. You don't have to beat them. You don't have to compete with them being tech savvy. But you do need to know enough so that you can keep them safe online. And as a parent, we do the best we can with what we know. Okay? Every parent, or most parents, um, and I'm sure you, given that you're listening to this, you do the best you can with what you know. So the more you know, the better parent you can be. Do you know enough already? This is a um, graph that applies to so many things and it definitely applies to this topic. You would already know some of what you need to know to keep your kids safe online. You already know some of it. You would know listening to this, that there's stuff that you don't know that um, you really should know that would be a very good thing to know that will keep them safe online. But here's the thing. So much, there is so much information on this topic that you just don't know that you don't know. And you don't know where to start. You're not looking for it because you don't even know that you don't know it. And this is the sort of stuff here that you need to know to keep your kids safe. This is what I can help you with. Um, and this is what really saves lives. So the third step is communicate, learn and collaborate. Um, this is not about you again. You can't win this in isolation. You can learn as much as you want to learn, but if you don't share it effectively with your kids and communicate with them, 
um, in the most effective way, then, then it's really a waste of time. Um, so this is about really, this is where you have peace of mind. This is where you can feel relaxed, okay? Everybody might be online doing their own thing, but you can relax because they know what they're doing. If they get into trouble, they're going to tell you about it or they're going to know how to respond and it's not going to have that negative effect on them. Um, so so important to have all three steps of this process in place. Any two steps without the third one just doesn't work. It's a whole process and a journey that I take you through. If you don't collaborate, um, then you've got that fear all the time. Oh, what if they see something they shouldn't? Oh, gosh, or have they already seen something and are they not telling me about it? Are they getting bullied? Are they seeing someone else get bullied? Are they being affected by that? Are they talking to strangers online? All this stuff um, that we get concerned about, um, you've got all that stuff there and we, we want to just get rid of that. Um, and we certainly don't want to ever live with any guilt if something does, does go wrong and we didn't do anything about it. So how it works, um, it's a comprehensive online training program. This goes for 10 weeks. And again, this is not available today. I'm not selling this to you today. I'm just letting you know what's out there. Um, there's a 10-week online training program. So you do it at home in your own time, in your pyjamas if you want. It doesn't matter. Um, the sessions, so you get a video with each session um, that is recorded. So you can watch it whenever you want. You can watch it as many times as you want. You can file it away. You can watch it, you know, years later if it's relevant then or months later or whatever. Um, I talk in the videos uh, as I talk now. So it's, it's pretty easy to understand. I'm not using any jargon. It's just plain English. I don't fluff it out. Um, there's pure content. Every hour is pure content. I don't fluff it out to create the hour. In fact, if anything, I have a hard time condensing the information to an hour. Um, there's, so included in the videos, there's also templates and resources and exercises. And what I do is give you the practical uh, tools that you need so that it makes it easy to actually implement what's in there um, and that's really key because it's applied knowledge it's not just knowledge is power but applied knowledge is power so make that really easy for you as well um, this is about reducing pain again prevention is better than a cure if you're already in a painful situation then certainly getting you out of it but ideally preventing them in the first place it saves you masses of time masses and masses of time um, i saw it, the police um, police do talks often on online safety and I went to one of their talks recently and they compared um, your child being online with teaching them, with giving them a license to drive a car. And so they're, they're, what they say is, well, look, you need to drive for 120 hours uh, to be safe before you, can, before you get your license and you can drive a car on your own. And giving them the internet is just as dangerous a vehicle as giving them a car to drive. Just, just as many things can go wrong um, and the damage can be just as bad. So. Um, so they're comparing, they're, what they're saying is you need to spend at least 120 hours with your child to keep them safe online. I would agree with that. If you were going to go out and research it all for yourself, I think at least that would be how long it would take. But what I'm saying to you is that I'll give you that much research in 10 hours. So I'm giving you what you need, but I'm giving it to you in a fraction of the time because who has that much time? Really, as a parent, we're not twiddling thumbs wondering what to do. So if you have hours and hours and hours and hours of time to go and research it all, then by all means off you go. That would be fantastic. Um, if you do that, because you'll be taking action. All I'm offering is, all I'm saying is out there, is a way to get that information in a fraction of the time. Um, and you do get results. How it helps, it helps you improve your communication skills with your kids, which is so important, the most important thing. It helps you manage the screen time, because um, I share what I did go into more detail on what I did and how you can help manage that. Um, it, it helps you with inappropriate content, avoiding that, uh, what to do about that. Predator proof your kids, porn proof them, help them um, use social media appropriately, help them become responsible digital citizens, which is really what you want. Help them deal with cyber bullying, increase privacy online, help you effectively monitor what they're doing. A lot of parents have parental control set up, but they're not effective. The kids have found a way to work around them ages ago and the parents have no clue. Um, and it helps you uh, encourage or enhance better face-to-face -face social skills, which a lot of kids, unfortunately, are missing. A bit of a lack of empathy going on when, when kids are communicating to a screen and not in front of someone's face and actually seeing their facial reactions. Benefits, happy, safe children. It's what we want, isn't it? Stronger relationships with them. You can be a better parent. There, that's, I mean, that's it, really. It stops you going down that path counselling, drugs, suicidal thoughts, actions, you don't want to go down that path. 
Um, I know someone who's been through it and, and honestly, you don't want to go down that path. Um, and yeah, it gives you peace of mind. Your kids are okay. Um, and yeah, that's the transformation. This is what that training is all about. Peace of mind, kids are okay online, you feel in control, you have more knowledge, you have more confidence, and you have a better relationship with your kids. So, I mean, if all that did was stop your child from being cyberbullied and heading down that path, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, is it worth it? You know, I'm thinking so. If all it did was prevent your child from being groomed by a predator online, is it worth it? I'm thinking so. If all it did was remove your fear about your child seeing porn online being affected by that, is it worth it? Um, so that's what's out there. Today, what, I'm, um, what I am offering is a, um, is a package uh, solution. It's a starting point. It's a very, very inexpensive starting point, and it's just something to get you on track so that you can easily take action right now um, to help your kids stay safe online. So what you get, uh, what I'm offering to you today is a copy of my book, How to Keep Your Children Safe Online um, and Put an End to Internet Addiction. I'll talk more about that in a sec. I'm offering you my membership, which I will um, talk to you in a little bit. Um, a month's free access to that. You'll see why that is so valuable. And I'm offering you a half-hour conversation directly with me. We'll probably be on Zoom like this um, where we can chat and I'll talk to you about that, what that involves. So my book um, is a <clears throat> well-researched book. I've put an awful lot of research into it. I, I've written it like a talk, so it's very easy to read. It's not hugely thick. It's like, you know, 104 pages. You can read that in a day. It's, it's quite easy to get through. Um, it has a lot of practical tips that you can implement. It has stories, like personal stories, um, really interesting stats that you should be aware of. Um, so it's got a lot of really good positive reviews, uh, definitely a good starting point. So you will get that. And that is part of what I'm offering um, for you to take advantage of today. Peaceful Digital Parenting Membership, what that is, is have a group where um, each month, uh, well, it's, it's a monthly ongoing membership because technology is obviously changing all the time and it's about staying up to date. So this is not something where you can go, okay, I know what's going on and I'm done and don't need to know anything else ever again because obviously it's changing all the time. So this is where I help you stay up to date on an ongoing basis with technology as it's affecting your kids. So I talk about games. Um, that kids are playing, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, sites that have come up that kids are using, new apps, um, where kids are at, what's trending, um, scams that to be avoided. I just review things. I, I don't, it's not a prescriptive thing where I say, look, this is good, your kids should do this, or this is bad, your kids shouldn't do this. I'm not interested in that. What I'm doing is saying, this is a very popular app that a lot of kids are playing. This is what it does. These are the benefits. These are the pitfalls. Um, and then you can make an educated decision. At least you know what's out there and then you can decide if you want your kids to be there or not. You can ask me about um, anything that uh, is going on if you don't understand what's going on or you want some help and I will research it and can talk about it through this membership. So it's really useful information. Um, but I've said technology changes all the time and it's so hard to keep up. And this is just why, part of the reason why it's so hard to keep up. And I, if you look at YouTube, which is the most popular site for kids to be on, um, what this graph is showing is that in 2014, 300 hours of YouTube were uploaded every minute online, every minute, 300 hours. In 2015, that went up from 300 to 400 hours. Um, 2016, 500 hours. Now, there's different stats on this. Um, I've read other stats that say it's still around 300 or, or 400 hours. Whether it's 300, 400 or 500, either way, that's a lot of content. The point is that this is a site where the content is uh, created by anyone and everyone. Some of it is really good, useful, quality content and some of it is definitely not. Um, a lot of the comments on the videos are far worse than the videos themselves. So there's way too much to keep up with. If you just can't keep up with this on your own. You know, Facebook. Facebook isn't growing so much in popularity because it's us. It's the oldies on Facebook now, not so much the kids. Um, but, you know, Instagram, Snapchat. These things are huge online and it's just crazy hard to keep up. Uh, so as well as sending you information, I'll explain in a sec how I do that. Um, and this is, um, I'm offering you a free month to this. Um, 
you get to join a community of like-minded and supportive parents. Now, this is key. If you go online and you ask a question or um, in any sort of parenting forums, I see every single time there is so much negativity um, and you get bagged down and, you know, you get accused of being you're just a lazy parent and all this crap that happens, seriously. Um, it's just not productive at all. So this is about... Um, joining with supportive parents. We can all share our sto stories. Why go through this uh, separately on your own when this is something that we're all experiencing together? It could be that someone else has been through a situation that you're going through and they can help you. They can share what they did, but maybe that would help you. It could be that you could share your stories to help other people. Um, it could be that you have a specific problem that you don't want everyone to know that you're having a problem that you could just private message me about and I can post it on, on, um, in this community and I can say, we have a parent who is going through la 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 la. Um, does anyone have any suggestions? Anyone else been through it? Um, so we can go through it that way where you don't, no one even has to know that it's you. So it's really, really useful in that way. So what the membership includes is a video. Now I record a video each, uh, each month. It, go, it only goes for half an hour. So it's not, this is not designed to be a lot of your time. The entire membership you can consume in less than an hour a month. Okay? So this is not a big time requirement at all. Um, in that half an hour, I select uh, key things that are happening at that point in time uh, that I think is most important that you need to know about. So it varies every time. This is kind of what they look like. These are some old ones. Um, you'll get access to um, all of the videos, not just the new ones as they come out, but all of the old ones that have been made. And you can pick and choose from the videos um, what you want to know about. So if you want to know about, if your kids want musically, you might want to know about that. You can just watch that bit of the video if you want to. If you want to know about sharing inappropriate images or um, internet addiction or you know, security concerns, whatever, whatever it is, you can pick bits that you want to see um, and that's what it looks like. But you get on a page, there's a whole page load of videos that you can pick the best bits from. You get a newsletter. So every two weeks you get one or the other. Every two weeks you get a, a video. Two weeks later you get a newsletter. Two weeks later you get a video. It just goes on like that. Uh, the newsletter also reviews apps. They look a bit like this. Um, they're all different. So I review a lot of parental control apps um, and help you choose if you want to choose any of those, how they work. Um, all sorts of different things, scams, what's happening in the news, the latest um, and greatest. And so again, all sorts of different information. You've got access to all the uh, newsletters that have, have been. So again, you can pick and choose what you want to read. It takes about 10 minutes to read a newsletter. Let's say half an hour for video, 10 minutes to read a newsletter. You get access to the closed um, Facebook group community that I was uh, talking to you about. Um, so I'm gifting you a month of that free. Otherwise, it's twenty dollars a month for that. It's like it's less, less than five dollars a week. It's a cup of coffee a week, um, and the information that you get from that can can go a long way, a long way to keeping your kids safe. Um, so yeah, so you get a free month of that anyway, um, and then. $20 if you want to continue with it. If you don't want to continue with it, don't. Just cancel it. You don't pay a cent. Um, you also get a 30-minute, I'm offering with you uh, a 30-minute call with me. So this is where we get to talk. So of me doing all the talking, um, we can talk together. I can understand um, a little bit whatever you want to share with me and what's going on for you, what help you would like, um, so that I can get we can get an understanding and I can um, figure out if I can help you more or not or what's going to be the most helpful thing for you moving forward. Uh, so that's what I'm offering the book, uh, the one month of that free membership, which is so, so valuable. It's way more valuable than $20 a month. I only charge that because I want it to be a nominal fee that just is a no brain. You don't even think about, um, but there's way more value in it. And the conversation with me, um, so that's available for $17.95 because that's the cost of the book plus posters and handling. I'll actually send it physically from here. Um, so it's $49.5 for the book and $3 postage handling. That's the offer for today. That is all that is available. Uh, if you have any questions on that, um, my email address is admin at childrenandtechnology.com. Right now at this point in time, the email address is actually very frustratingly not working, but I can receive emails. Um, I just can't send it from that address. I'll fix that hopefully soon. Um, if it's not fixed, I'll, I'll send you back one from another address, but you can email me certainly there, admin at childrenandtechnology.com. So next steps from here, if you want to accept that offer, if you want to go with it, get the book, grab the book, $17.95, you get the book, you get a month's free membership and you get a 30-minute call with me to talk more. 
um, just send me an email to admin at childrenandtechnology.com um, and let me know that you would like to accept that offer. Um, after you do that, I will send you a link that you can use so that you can buy the book or alternatively, uh, you can give me the details and I can organise for you to get the book. Either way, whatever's easier, it doesn't matter. Um, once you've done that, I will send you, um, I'll set you up with access to that membership and get that free month's membership. You can check out what is there now. Um, and yeah, you'll get access to new videos as they come up. We can also book in that 30 minute call at a time that suits us both. Um, and we can talk more. And I just, I really look forward to helping you. This is something that you really do need to take action on. There is just way too many pitfalls, way too many things that can go wrong. The likelihood of your child um, getting involved with something is very, very high. Um, so yeah, let's take some action. Let's, at least you can be one of those parents who, whose kids will approach you. Your kids will be that much safer. And I just want to leave it just reminding you that, again, this is not about us. This is about your children, but it's about a whole community. It's about keeping kids safe. So I'm going to leave it on that. I'm going to leave you with um, this email here. That's the process. Um, do send me an email. I'll respond to you as soon as I can. I look forward to hearing from you. Um, thank you so much. I really hope that you found that useful. Um, it's been a pleasure to share it with you. And I hope to catch up with you later. Thanks so much. See you later. Bye.